Amen. Mark chapter 6. We're going to be at verse 33 down to verse 44. I'm going to read the story straight through, so just follow with me and then we'll break it down. Mark chapter 6, verse 33. It says, the people saw them going, and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and it's already quite late. Send them away so they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And they went and found out, they said, five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up towards heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves and kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces and also of the fish. And there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. An amazing story here for us to see, something that Mark records. What's really awesome in this story is that it's, it's one of the only stories that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. So all of the Gospel writers were touched by this one miracle that happens. And they're touched in such a way as that it's remembered to be brought forth, given to us to read. A lot of different things, maybe just mainly the resurrection of Christ. Out of all the different stories that each gospel portrays, this is in every single one. And it showed forth in a, in a cool way. Jesus feeding these 5,000 people. If you remember the story, the disciples had been sent out by Jesus to go and heal the sick and, and uh, cast out demons. We know according to all the Gospels, even Jesus said, raise the dead. Go out, I'll give you authority over the forces of evil to tell those forces of evil to leave people and to bring healing into those who are sick. And they go out and they start to do it. There's an excitement in the air. People are honoring them. There's something really, we saw this last week. If you weren't here, you can get the CD. But they were being honored. All of a sudden, there was a, a great glamour that was happening in ministry, and people were looking towards them. Remember when Jesus did all his healings? Everybody glorified God. And when he sent the apostles out to go, the people were glorifying them. And they had to learn the difference between glamour and glory, how glamour belongs to men and it's not something God wants but glory belongs to God and that's what he wants to be the fruit of any type of healing or deliverance from demonic power and as they came back to Jesus they're all excited they're they're tired they've been out for a few days they haven't had much to eat they're exhausted they come back, they're explaining to him all the great things they had accomplished. And there's a real excitement in the air. And Jesus looks at them, he sees, up oh, these guys need a break. But what they don't know is he's about to teach them a lesson. He says, let's get into the boat with me. We'll go out a little bit and find a place for rest. So in their minds, they have accomplished some fantastic feat of ministry. They have done it to exhaustion. They've worked their fingers to the bone, what they consider for the glory of God. And now they're looking for a chance to eat, sit down. It means have a meal, to sit down together and have fellowship and a meal. And they're looking for a rest. They're exhausted. They're tired. So it's at the peak where they have not eaten and they're hungry. They have not slept and they're tired. And Jesus offers them a rest. Get in the boat, go out a little while with me to a place that's private, just us. And they're like, great, I have been looking for some time off just with Jesus. And this is how the story starts. Verse 33, 
The people saw them going. Many recognized them, and they ran together on foot uh, from all the cities, and they got there ahead of them. So, so if you ever go to Israel, if you've ever been there, and it's a clear day, if you go down to the Sea of Galilee, you can literally stand on some of the hills before the Sea of Galilee, and you can see all the way across to the other side. So you can look all the way down this way. I think it's 15 miles by 7 miles, but you can see across. So, so Jesus gets the disciples in a boat. They're hungry. They're tired. They're exhausted. They're looking for a well-needed rest. What they don't know is he already has the events of the day planned out. He knows what they need. They know what they want. Get in the boat. And as they go, the people see him. So you're not going to get away from the crowd. When you're out there healing sick and you're out there <laughs> Uh, and miracles are happening in people's lives, and they're carrying their sick looking for you, you're not going to get away. They don't realize that. And what you need is the strength of the Lord, not the strength of man. And they're about to get that real quick. So they get in the boat, all the people look, they're watching him, he's going across, and then let's go, and they run alongside the shore. You've got to think, there's, there's, we know there's, there's 5,000 men. That means, the term means besides women and children. So there's probably, as a minimum, 10,000 people. And they're rushing along the shore, following this boat with the, Jesus and the disciples. And they get ahead of them, so they see him coming in. And so as they come on, you know, you got to think, you're the disciples, and they're, and they're following you. <laughs> like, I'm trying to get away. And, uh, and we're going back to the shore, and, and they're crowding this 10,000 people. You know, I'm already, ex I have nothing to give. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to share. I'm exhausted. I'm hungry. And we're pulling into the port. And on the shore waiting for me is 10,000 people. I'm not going to get my much needed rest. I'm not going to get my much deserved dinner. And as they pull into the port, it says, verse 34, When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. He steps out of the boat. They're all there. He's got about 10,000 people. And he sees the crowd. It says, he saw a large crowd. This is really important. It's something the disciples hadn't grasped yet. It means he looked deep into their issues, okay? He saw the people, but he looked beyond why they were there, and, and, and he understood that they were drawn to him by his Father. He grasped a fact here. He grasped a fact. You have sent me, Father, to do your will, and I am here to accomplish your will. And I am with my disciples, and we're exhausted, and we're tired, and we're hungry. But I realize something that nobody else realizes. You, my father, who run and are in control of every single circumstance in my life, have brought these people to me. What am I going to do about it? Am I going to lean upon myself? Or am I going to lean upon you for the strength to do whatever is before me today? And that's the picture that's painted there. And here's the disciples. They're there. Jesus steps out. He sees the crowd. It says he felt compassion for them. An amazing term here means deep within his bowels, he was moved towards mercy for them. Deep in his inner, inner core. You know, where the strength of God is, not where the strength of Ron is. Beyond that. You know, the strength of me is actually, I think it's in my inner core, it's not, it's my flesh. It's all about me, that's my strength. And yet Jesus, his strength came from his Father, and that was deep in his inner core, and that's where he was moved to the mercy of God towards them. I realize you have brought them, and if you have brought them into my life, well, I have not been sent here to condemn them. I have not been sent here to judge them. Oh, there's a time coming, condemnation, judgment. There's a time that's going to come. But that is not why you sent me here, Father. You sent me here to accomplish your will, not mine. And you sent me to give them mercy. So I 
look towards them with the mercy that you give. And he says, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Really important. It means he understood that many were hungering and thirsting after the words of righteousness because they had no spiritual leaders who truly were willing to feed them the truth of God's hope for them. See, the Pharisees were just, they were willing to teach a religious way. The religious leaders of the time, they were willing to teach the law, which is all they had. But they didn't understand that behind the law was the true hope of God for all mankind. And Jesus looked at them and he realized they had no spiritual guidance at all. They were not being led by their spiritual leaders to the divine truth of God's word is that God is offering hope, not condemnation. He's offering life, not judgment and death. And so he saw that very clearly in their life. So he was moved towards God's mercy for them that they might learn of God's love for them. You gotta understand that when God allows anybody in your life, it's not for your sordid gain. It's for his glory. And he gets the glory when you show them how much he loves them, how much he cares for them. You may not have all their answers, and you may not be able to explain. I can't explain many answers to many people. But I can show you how much your Father in Heaven loves you, whether you believe it or not, is irrelevant to me. But my responsibility is to show you that He loves you right now, just as you are. And Jesus looked at the people that way. So he looks at them, he's moved with compassion for them, and it says, he began to teach them many things. This is an amazing statement here. It means literally, he began to teach them the true, the good, and the fit things they needed to know from the word of God. So as they came into him, he began to teach them the word of God, but what he taught them was that which is true, that which is good, and that which is fit. Now true means accurate. Literally, it means God loves you now, not later when you straighten out your life. Let me explain. It's the very first thing you need to know from the word of God. We're not going to go back and open up Deuteronomy and show you where you need to stone your son, okay, period. Period. We're going to open this book up, Jesus said, and I'm going to show you that God loves you right now the way you are before your life gets straightened out. Settle in that. That's what's true. This is the one truth you need to hold on to. Your Father in Heaven loves you just the way you are now before you try to straighten your life out. And he'll help you with that, big time. And then he te he's showing them what's good. Now the term good means well or sound. So it implies very strongly that this teaching of God's word towards you, if it's believed on by you or trusted in by you, will literally make you well and sound. This is how you're going to become up here and in here well and sound. How do you have a sound mind? How do you have a well, sound heart? How do you live your life not tossed about by your emotions uh, without any direction at all? It's by receiving the teaching of the Word of God. I think in America today, we have Christian services that, that are broadcasted all over the world and are taught every Sunday and throughout the week and people bounce around from teaching to teaching to teaching just hearing what they like and then moving on to hear something else but never really truly applying it to their life because the teaching of God's Word is never given so somebody can hear it and walk away happy it's given so it can be received by God's people into their own life so that they can be made sound and well here and here. And that's why the word goes forth. So Jesus is teaching this. So he's teaching them what's true. Your father loves you right now. Be settled in that before you try to change your life. All right? And, and the teaching of this word 
if it's trusted in by you, if it's believed on by you, will make you well and sound. And then he's showing them what's fit of the word of God. And fit is a cool word. It means to invade. A strong, powerful picture. It means this. You, it'll invade your very being if you let it. That this word of God will help you battle disorder and chaos and confusion. This teaching if, if, will help you adapt to whatever's before you. If you receive the word as it's taught, it will help you in a, in a way to battle disorder, to battle the chaos that's before you, to battle the confusion that's before you. And it will teach you how to be adapted to whatever situations before you. So he's teaching them. He sat down to teach. He has compassion. Okay, it's not, we, we have compassion on people. It's not just that we love them, move around, and walk away. No, we love them in spite of who they are. We love them in spite of what they are. We love them because our Father in Heaven loves us enough. He gave us His Son for free and we received Him. And then He sends us out to love others. And as we love them, part of that is to talk to them. And when you talk to them, you teach them. Your Father loves you. Settle it. Because that will help you change. And not just that, His love for you is so strong. Uh, it will actually, if you believe it, it'll make you sound and well. And not just that, receiving that word will actually, and it'll invade your life and begin to throw aside all the disorder, all the chaos that's in front of you. You'll be able to see things very, very, very clearly. You're going to see the love of God very clearly. That's an amazing picture. So that's what Jesus is doing here uh, in, in, an, in an awesome way. In fact, in Psalm 1, if you read it a lot, it's, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he does meditate day and night. His love is for the word of God, the receiving of the word of God, not just the, the knowledgeable part of it. It's receiving it into his life and letting it change him. And as he does, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Jesus is teaching all the people this. And, and the amazing thing is they don't, most of them don't get it. But he still does it because the compassion of God, the mercy of God is in him for them. And he's pouring it out upon them. Uh, in verse 35, it says, When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate and it's already quite late. Um, At 36, send them away so that they may go inside the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. This is a pretty amazing uh, picture here. It's already quite late. It means it's way beyond late. You know what that term means? His son goes out, I'm just going out with my friends. All right, be home. Don't be home late. And he gets in around 3. What do you say? It's way beyond late, man. <laughs> right? It's like way beyond late. That's what his disciples come to him. They go, Lord, Lord, yes. It's, <laughs> look at all these people. Man, it is way beyond late. I think their stomach is going, we, I'm hungry. And their body's going, I'm tired. <laughs> and it's way beyond late. That's the statement there, and it's a strong one. And also, his disciples come to him. Right? This is the first committee formed in the New Testament. <laughs> Right? Not like if Peter just doesn't come up and go, all right, Jesus, I need to talk to you. You know, there's a lot of people here, and uh, I think we need to do something about feeding them. No, no, they get together and they talk. They form the first committee. All right, we, we need to talk. All right? <laughs> they get this big, and they all come, Jesus, we have something to say. <laughs> all right, here we go. Uh, committees are an amazing thing. Uh, I think a committee is a group of people who individually can do nothing and then who collectively decide that nothing can be done. That's what, that's what a committee does. This is the first one form. 
We are here to let you know what we're afraid to tell you. <laughs> what is that? Um, that we need to get these people out of here. All right, that's real quick. Uh, they say, well, this place is desolate. It's quite late. Send them away that they might buy themselves. What they're saying here is this. We are exhausted. They are exhausted. We are hungry. They are hungry. And there's nothing here for anyone to eat or for any place for anyone to find rest. So send them away. And it's an amazing thing because to the disciples, the crowds were a problem. You see, to the disciples, the crowds were a nuisance. The crowds that the Father brought to them were in their way of a soul longed for rest and meal. So instead of viewing through the eyes of Jesus, who Jesus is looking at them like sheep without a shepherd, his, the mercy of God is, is coming from him. He's looking at them through his Father's eyes. They haven't learned yet how to look through the eyes of their Lord at the people that God brings into their life. And that's an amazing thing to learn. It's something sometimes that takes you and I many, many years to learn. Do you understand? Situations. Your Father in Heaven is wholly and completely in charge of every single circumstance, situation, and person involved in your life. He has allowed them there for a purpose and a reason that's beyond your comprehension. And you are and we are supposedly learning to be disciples of Jesus Christ. So we have to come to a place in our life by the teaching of the Word of God where I realize, Lord, you have allowed this into my life. And I have been looking at it as an absolute nuisance. I've been looking at this thing as the great problem that's in front of me so I can't step forward and accomplish what I think needs to be done. And the Father says, and Jesus says to you and I, no, I've allowed them into your life. Are you looking through my eyes at them? Because I want them to receive my mercy. I want them to know the truth of my word. I want them to, be, to know what's good in my word, and I want to see them fit from my word. See, the disciples had it all back, so, but they had to learn that. And they're at this place. They're going, wow, I, I can't take care of this. I don't know how to deal with this, Lord. 5,000 men, total about 10,000, maybe even 12,000 with children there too. That's an enormous crowd. How do we handle this? What do we do about it? Verse 37, he, he answered them. Now, again, he doesn't give them a question. He's answering their statement. And he says to them, you give them something to eat. That's an amazing term there. Um, you, it means you be hospitable towards them and feed them. It literally translated in the Greek, it means let God provide for them through you. He says to them, hey, your father in heaven brought them. And if he brought them, he can provide for them. Let him do it through you. They, they, can't, eat, they can't grasp that for one second. They're going, are you, are you kidding me? Us feed them? They say to him, uh, literally, uh, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? You know, that's like almost a year's wages. Am I going to go spend like $8,000? Even if I had $8,000, I couldn't buy enough food for them to eat. And, and that's their focal point. The amazing thing is this is all they could understand. They could only grasp that, that God could not even provide through their financial material or their material finances enough to feed all these. All they can grasp is how do we feed these people? Well, it's got to cost what? Money. Because they can't grasp that God can work outside of the economy of money. 
They can't grasp that. Oh, no, no, money is how you pay the bills. Money is how you live. You know, money is everything. Wait a minute. To you and I, money's not everything. In fact, money is, should be the lowest part on the list because God is everything and Jesus Christ is everything. And he doesn't need my finances to accomplish his will. He doesn't need your finances to accomplish his will. He's not looking towards finances to accomplish his, his, his will. He can do as he pleases, and he has the authority to do it. He can feed 70,000 people without finances. But the disciples could only grasp that that much food has to come from that much finances. Did you ever come to that place in your life? Where you think, well, I'm here today, and for me to be here next year, I need this much finances, or I'm not going to make it. And then, okay, let's there, and so it looks like I'm not going to make it to next year, so how am I going to make the next 10 years? And God's saying, why are you viewing worldly material wealth when I am greater than that? And I have saw you through all your struggles and trials over the last lifetime. Don't you think I can carry you on here? Don't you think you can trust me through this? It's something they had to learn. And again, you don't learn it because you read it somewhere. You learn it because you walked it out. You learned it because God brought you through it and he loved you enough to bring you through difficult times where you were stretched and you had to rely upon him. And that's what builds faith and strengthens believers. That's what he's showing his disciples here in an awesome way. They're going, there's not enough money to do that. And Jesus is kind of like, <laughs> I don't need no money. I'm God and I'm greater than your finances. In verse 38, and he said to them, oh no, yeah. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And they went out and they found, and they said, five and two fish. This is awesome. He goes, how much bread, how much loaves do you have? You know, everybody eats bread. Go, go see what God's got. Literally, it means sink out of sight and look deep into what you have already been provided with. Amazing. What he says to them is unbelievable because they're all up in a to-do. They just got done getting out of a boat of exhaustion, looking for rest. They just got done being glorified and glamorized by the people because of the great ministry they were part of. And right now, they don't realize it, but they have put themselves on what? A platform. And they're up there on this platform. You know, everybody was just looking to me yesterday and, and, and rest, and, and I was doing this great work, and, and here I am. Jesus is going, you feed them. I, how can I feed them? I got a lot of glamour right now. And he says to them, go look. It means sink out of sight. Literally, literally, it means... Uh, Get off your platform and get down in among the people and see what God has already provided. Your father has already put provision in their midst. But no, you're way above them right now. Right now, you're so high above them, you can't even see them through your father's eyes. You've put yourself on such a pedestal, which you had to do, which they don't realize, but they had to do that to be brought down. Hey, how do, you, how do you get knocked down off your platform? You have to what? First, get on it. And until you're knocked off your platform, you'll never know what it's like, really, to be on a platform. Do you ever have somebody knock the chip off your shoulder? Do you ever have that? I've had that. You know what it meant? What, it meant what? I had a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> But until I had a chip on my shoulder and got it knocked off, I never realized it was there. And I've been on platforms and I've been knocked off them. And you know how I know I was knocked off it? Because I was on it. Because had I not been on a platform, I couldn't have been knocked off it. But they had to learn that. 
It's called going from childhood through your teen years. I guess you could say a disciple is a teenager. You know what I'm saying? those times? You know, just learning to ride your bike and you flip over or you go from climbing trees to liking girls. This, this whole change thing is going on. And you're like, I don't get this. I don't understand. There's no book here to show me. <laughs> I'm bringing you on to maturity. Things are not right in my heart and my feelings and my knees. I just don't get it. You'll get it. Just keep going. Because you know what you're doing? You're learning to mature. You're learning to make different choices. You're learning to leave behind the things of childhood and take upon the things of adulthood. It's something you're learning right now. And that's what his disciples are learning. And he gave them the grace to learn it. And that's an amazing thing when I see that. Because I think in, in many Christian circles today, we don't give each other the grace to mature. That means we might, may not see things eye to eye. We may, we may totally bump into each other head to head. And yet our Father in Heaven has allowed that to be that we might sometimes get knocked off our platform. Sometimes we need to be brought low to realize we had lifted ourselves up high. And when that happens, we begin to view things now through our Father's eyes. And it's something that they're really learning. You know, God would be telling them, I didn't send the crowds so they could be a nuisance to you. I sent the crowds so you could give them my son or bring them to my son. So Jesus says, go. Go, go see what the Father's already provided in their midst. Step down. Uh, so they go out and they find, you know, they say five loaves and two fish. You know, we look at all the Gospels together. We know it's a it means a child's lunch. And what's really cool is the, the lunch pail is about that big. See this? That's about how big his basket was. So he has this little basket and he's got five loaves, which would have been some small barley loaves, which were not big, very small, like a Dunkin' Donut, the round, what's that, Dunkin' Munchkin, about that big. That's what it would have been, but made of barley, just barley, like poor man's lunch. And the fish would have been like two small perch, little, little perch, all dried up. You take them, you take them in half, you break them, and you just eat the inside. That's it. That's your lunch. But that's a child's lunch. So they come to Jesus. They, this is what they find, a child's lunch. Here, we got five small barley biscuits and two small dried perch. You know, it's like, okay, bring it to him. I wonder if they, you know, got the committee together, and they're like, oh, Peter, you bring it, you know, because I ain't bringing it. <laughs> I'm not going there, man. Yeah, just take it to him. So they walk up. They're holding it. They're standing there. Um, and he says to them in verse 39, he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. This is really cool. Uh, literally means tell them to sit down orderly and relax and prepare for a meal. That's what it means. Because they would all sit down in groups and eat. So he, they go and they have this, these two little perch, little perch, and these, and these five little biscuits, and they're standing there, this is what we got. I wonder if they even brought it to him as a joke or maybe some little kid was like, you can have my lunch. Here, take it. <laughs> it's like the, the faith of a child. They take it to Jesus. So they bring it, they're holding it. This is what we got. He says, have the people sit down and relax orderly in small groups and tell them to prepare for a meal. And what's really cool here, he says, on the green grass. And that's recorded in all, the, in all of them. What's awesome is uh, it means green pastures. Tell them to sit down and relax in the green pastures. See, they don't grasp what's going on here. Listen to this, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and thou anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's been doing that since he stepped off the boat. 
He's been teaching them the, the righteousness that God wants to pour upon them. He's been showing them how to relax in the word of God that he's given them and how they'll be made whole because of it. Then he says to the disciples, give them something to eat. Like, they don't have a clue. They're all up and beyond. He says, get off your platform and go find what my father has already provided for them. And they come back, two fish, five barley loaves. And he says, tell my sheep to sit down in these green pastures because their cup is going to run over because I am here to feed them. And that's an amazing picture. He portrays the work of a shepherd. He portrays the exact work the Word of God says He is. And He does it right before His disciples. And they don't get it now. But I think they get it later on as He's resurrected from the dead and the Holy Spirit comes up. I think they begin to grasp it. That's what He was doing. He was fulfilling the Word of God right in front of us. And we didn't even see it at the time. In verse 40, it says, They sat down in groups of hundreds, in the fifties, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up towards heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves and kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up all the fish, the fish, two fish among them all. This is an awesome picture too. Um, he took the, the loaves and the fish. You know, in Matthew chapter 14, as, as it's recorded in the other gospel, it's at this time that Jesus says, bring it to me, bring it to me. So they have the stuff, and he says, tell the people to sit down. Tell them to prepare for a meal, to relax in the green pastures. So they all sit down, and then they got this, these two fish and these loaves. Now what do we do? And Jesus says, bring it to me. And they go and they bring it to him. And that's an amazing thing, because there is no possible way on earth that they could feed 5,000 people. The little that they had. And this is what their Father in Heaven provided for all these people. God gives you and I things. And you go, I want to serve the Lord. I want to see my life change. I want to serve my wife. I want to serve my family. I want to serve my husband. But all I have is this. I, I only have this. And it's not working. I've tried to do it. It doesn't work. He's, he's angry. She's mad. It's, the kids are out of... I can't do it. What do you bring it? Bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Him. Well, this is all God's provided for me, and it's, it's nothing. It's nothing compared to the, the unbelievable odds that I have to face. You bring it to the hands of the Lord, because in the hands of Jesus Christ, it will become multiplied there to accomplish the will of God. It will not be in my hands or your hands. You have been given by your Father in heaven every single thing you already need for what's on your plate today. Take it to Him. Because in the hands of Jesus Christ, it's an amazing thing that, that God can do to provide. Unbelievable. How do we, as a fellowship of believers, go out and reach the untold thousands who don't know Jesus Christ? You think that we can do it in our own strength? You won't get 10 feet. Bring it to the Lord. How do we feed 5,000 people? We don't have enough, there's not enough food in Brattleboro. <laughs> you feed them all. Bring it to the Lord. What he's provided for you will be multiplied in his hands to accomplish everything that needs to be done. What he's teaching his disciples to do is to trust in what he's provided for and then to go to him to see it happen. Watch this. It says, literally, he took it, he blessed it, then he broke it, he gave it to his disciples. It says he divided it among the people. That means all the people. This is an awesome picture too. He blesses it. The first thing he does, he takes these two little fish, these five loaves, and he lifts it up to heaven. It means he gave thanks. And the first thing I'm going to know is, Father, thank you for what you've provided. Now the disciples are probably standing there going, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> You lift it up to heaven. That's the miracle, right? You lift it up. 
Thank you, Father, for what you provided for. Bring it down. It's the same. Five loaves and two fish. Lift it up again, Jesus. It didn't multiply. Bring it down. <laughs> Nothing's happening. <laughs> Jesus just stands there and he says, Father, thank you. Thank you for what you provided for all these people. And then it says, and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. That means both the bread and the fish. And that's an amazing thing. It means literally he kept breaking it. So the term means that the miracle was happening in his hands. So he took the loaves and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he went back and it was whole. And he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he went back and it was whole. And he kept breaking it and it kept being whole. And, he, and, he, and then he took the fish and he broke the fish and he gave it to his disciples and he came back and it was whole. And so the, the, really it's the disciples that are watching the miracle take place. And it's like he just keeps, it just keeps coming. I don't get it. It's like, I don't know. Go hand it out to everybody. Go give it to all people. Give them the bread. Give them the fish. And the more he broke, the more it just kept happening. And that's what the term means. They watched it happen. And that's, it's in the hands of Jesus Christ. What's amazing in this, literally, is the lunch of a child is being handed out to all who was there. It's been blessed. It's been broken by the hands of Jesus Christ. And now it's multiplying in the very eyes of all people. Sometimes we're afraid of brokenness, aren't we? We go, oh, I'm just, I don't want to face brokenness again. If you face brokenness on your own or because of your own to do, all you've got in front of you is pain. But when you let your life or what you have been provided for by God be broken in the hands of Jesus Christ, it will be poured out to feed thousands. It's learning to let him handle what he's given me. Maybe you're here today, you say, well, all I have is my life. Well, that's the first thing he wants to break. And when he breaks it, it will be handed out for all. It won't be used by him until it's allowed to be broken by him. And for that to happen, you have to give it to him. You have to hand it over. And then from that day forward, anything that he's provided for you, for others, is given back to him. To be broken by him and to be handed out. That's an amazing picture. I think we live in a day and age today where, where people refuse to be broken they don't want the hand of God. Lord, you can save me. Thank you for the salvation. But man, don't break me because I'm happy with my life. Things are going the way I want. I'm financially secure. I'm set in this and everything. Just please, I don't want no more brokenness. Well, if you haven't been handed out for other people to receive nourishment by, you really haven't been broken yet. Because that's a blessed brokenness. A brokenness that has been blessed and lifted up to God first and then broken and poured out for all. Remember when Paul said, I, I, here I am, I'm like a drink offering poured out for you all. Paul gave his whole life and said, take me, bless me, break me, whatever you want to do in me, I am here for your glory, Lord. I live my life for glamour and I'm not walking that way again. I want to be in this for your glory. And Jesus is there. His arms are open for anybody to pour into. This is all I have, Lord. Whatever you are today, maybe you're a housewife, maybe you're a, a, a laborer, maybe you're uh, whatever you are. You go, I don't have, this is all I have. That's all I got. I'm with the kids all day. They're screaming, they're yelling. They're, I, this is all I have. I want to serve you. Let's give it to me. Give it to me. Because I'll take it, and I'll bless it, and I'll break it. And it will multiply for my glory. Well, that's what I want, Lord. Well, that's what the disciples are learning. They just left glamour. Now they're understanding. For glory, there needs to be brokenness. And the brokenness is blessed of God. That's the picture that's there. Um, in verse 42, it says, They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the 12 baskets full of the broken pieces and also the fish. And there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. This is awesome. It says they were satisfied. 
All right? It means literally the term satisfied, to be gratified to the utmost desire. It means to be so full, you're full to the bottom of your throat and you're content. All right? That's like Thanksgiving. You, ever, you sit down for your Thanksgiving meal. And when you first get there, you're like, no, no peanuts, man. I want turkey. I want some grub. Then you start eating, and you know one thing leads. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I'm full, but I'm happy. I'm stuffed. And then they bring the apple pie out and the pumpkin pie. They're like, hey. And you're like, I can't. Oh, I can't do it. I can't. Just give me 20 minutes, and I'll walk around. Let's go for a walk. Come back to put more in. That's what it means. I mean, they just, they started to eat, and it was, it was fantastic. And they, and they devoured it, and they were at a place where they're just sitting there, and they're like, oh, oh you okay? Oh, 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 I'm just stuffed. And they were happy, and they were content. They received from the Lord. The disciples are, now, the disciples haven't eaten yet. They're serving. Imagine, you know, it's been, it's been, it's been days, I'm hungry, I'm exhausted, I'm tired. I saw an awesome miracle, five loaves, two fish. I mean, that was awesome. But I'm hungry. <laughs> I'll just go hand it out. They're serving. Well, he's got something prepared for them, right? It says they picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces and fish. It, the baskets means small lunch size baskets. And that's one for each. There's 12 disciples there. There's 12 apostles. And Jesus says, hey, go gather up what's left here. Take these baskets. And they come back. Each one had a basket. They're like, uh, the basket left. Yeah, that's your lunch. That's your dinner. My people have eaten. The sheep have a shepherd. The labor has been cared for. The ministry has been walked out. And you're still alive. And you're still ready to face another day. And guess what? I set aside lunch for you. So take it with you wherever you go. God takes care of those who serve if they truly serve him, even if they do it wrong. Because they'll learn. Every servant of the Lord is learning what it means to be a servant of the Lord. And you know how you learn that? By doing it wrong sometimes. And you know what you walk away with? Lunch. Pretty awesome. Feed my sheep. I will. You bet. They walk away with their own little thing. Let's sit down and let's have a meal. It's an amazing picture that's painted there. He cares for them all the way. And, and the whole time, you know, as they form their committee, they're griping, they're moaning. I'm going to go talk to him. I can't feed these people. They're a nuisance to me. They're in my way. And they realize, oh, you can feed them. And you do care for them. And I wasn't viewing them the way you view them. I understand that now, Lord. Very much so. And all I have to do is what you tell me. Love them, serve them, feed them. And you will provide for me. Even what's left over from them. That's an amazing picture to me. And it says uh, 5,000 men who ate this meal. It literally means besides women and children. It means that men were there. What it means when it says... 5,000 men, it means that the, that the disciples probably went out and they gave to the head of each family plenty for everybody and they handed it out to their wives and to their children and they sat down and they ate. And so there was probably about 10,000 to maybe 12,000 people just there. I mean, just, and all fully stuffed, all satisfied and content with what God provided. And the disciples learned an amazing, amazing lesson that uh, in what Jesus can offer as far as satisfaction goes, they realize, you know, my hands could never satisfy those people. My greatest labor only brought me glamour. My greatest work only gave me a platform. But what I learned in this is that when I bring what God has provided for me, for them to the hands of Jesus Christ he will satisfy them and it won't be any other way and they realize that in a very 
appointed way. Jesus offers food to the hungry. He offers rest to the weary. He offers hope for the hurting, strength and peace for the broken, and joy for the poor. Hey, listen, church, real important. Are, are you finding what you're looking for, or are you still striving after the wind? Because what you're looking for is only found in the hands of Jesus Christ. You will not find it in any other way. You can go to church for the rest of your life and you still won't have peace. You can read 10,000 Christian books and you'll still waver in unsurety. But if you want satisfaction and you want that to settle in your core and you want to have the joy of the Lord active and alive in your life, you can only find it in the hands of Jesus Christ. And that's all I offer you every time we come together. Look to Him. Trust in Him. It's an active step of humility on your part and mine to lay down my will and to lay down my pride and to receive his will for my life. To even wake up sometimes daily and say, Lord, I need your love in me today. I'm not going to love people in my strength anymore. I can't do it. I don't have the strength to do it. But it's your love and I need to receive it so I can hand it out. Thank you for the salvation you give. Thank you for the grace and the mercy you give me. But I want to walk this according to your will. It's an amazing picture painted. The feeding of the 5,000. I think the real miracle was what happened in the lives of the disciples. Not so much that Jesus, he can feed the world if he wanted to. But they learned something. Well, I, when I handle ministry, this is where it goes. But when he handles what he's given me, people are satisfied with what he's offered and I can settle in that. An amazing picture painted. Learn to trust him. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us to, to walk through your word. And Lord, I pray for your word today that it would be planted deep in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. That it would take root and, and really truly begin to transform our lives. Strengthening our hearts and our minds. Making us sound and whole and well and fit giving us the hope of your divine truth, of your love for us. I thank you for that grace, Lord. Continue to lead us each and every day. And as you love us and as we receive your love through your Son, help us pour that out to all those around us. You can accomplish everything you want in our lives. You freely have your way. Be honored, be glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.